Okay, so we were, um, in my last lecture, I was talking about um, the sagas, the conversion of Iceland to Christianity, and um, these stories that were told. Um, by the way, also, um, it's interesting, there's one saga called the Laxdala Saga, and um, women play a pro prominent role. Some even believe that women, a woman may have even written the, the saga. What's interesting about the Vikings and the Mongols were like this too, and it's kind of a perplexity to myself and many people who study this. Vikings, like the Mongols, would go out and rape and pillage. And I'll return to the grim topic of rape. Um, and you know, many families were destroyed because of their actions in their battles. On the other hand, uh, women as wives, like with the Mongols, as with the uh, Vikings, at least in the stories of the sagas, have a much stronger role than we're, that, we're, that we are used to seeing in many other cultures around the world. Um, and you even have a woman in the Laxdala saga who starts off, who's considered one of the founders uh, of, of one of the colonies in Iceland, um, she has two different names. The one that she's known most uh, um, is Un, Un the High-Minded. So she's got a complimentary name. She comes from an, a Scottish island, bringing back a large entourage, showing uh, kind of wealth and power. And then she disseminates her goods, which is considered in a very fair way. So she has very strong qualities and powers, and she dies in great honor and um you know women their their roles are are you know they, they play very significant roles you know there's the tv show vikings talks about the shield maidens and that's still very controversial you know were there really women all the time fighting besides men was um i think i i, I can't really touch that i i just know that it's it's debated about still. But what is clear, and I've read uh, several of the sagas, that you, you wouldn't call this literature feminist by any means uh, in a modern sense. Um, and you certainly have the cases of where, well, for example, in that same saga, uh, a, a man of Norwegian descent takes an Irish sex slave he makes a baby with her and it becomes his favorite child and she's the concubine. His wife is upset about it and then he has to make a separate farm for his concubine and his favorite son um, because uh, the wife is mad. And um, what ends up happening is that the sex slave from Ireland ends up um, getting a big farm and um, she's eventually allowed to, to get married to a wealthy man herself. And, um, and then her son ends up taking on a very prominent role uh, uh, in society. It's just gender relations are, <laughs> as described in this time period, don't meet our um, values now or expectations. But it, it's, a, it's a curiosity. And, um, you know, I think that the... Um, the topic of gender in these sagas are very interesting, especially when we're trying to think about and conceptualize the Vikings from what we hear about from outside sources or how you think about them in popular uh, culture. Okay. Um, and, um, and then uh, I just need to mention, so I'm going to have to kind of move on quickly. Snorri Sturluson, this is a statue of him in Reykjavik in uh, Iceland. He is like Shakespeare to Iceland or more. And actually, um, as one writer um, mentioned, that this is the most influential writer in the Western world that you've never heard of, or most likely never heard of. So um, basically, he's a 13th century Icelander. Okay, He was a historian, a poet, and a politician. He um, he lived a very controversial life. I don't have much time to go into him. He was kind of a shady character, but he left such an important legacy that we can't um, ignore him. First of all, he probably wrote the Eagle Saga, which 
is a great saga, by the way. It's really interesting. That's a truly Viking saga. And he's believed to have written, um, compiled a textbook uh, called the Prose Ada. And the Adas are the next and the last important topic I'm going to discuss here. But let me just mention this. Snorri Sturluson, who I was just mentioning, um, J.R.R. Tolkien basically viewed the sagas and um, these Adas as one of the most important forms of literature uh, for the development uh, of even the English speaking world. And there was a debate that he had, Tolkien, with um, uh, Lewis, um, G.S. Lewis, on basically trying to supplant, to, to demote Shakespeare in the English department and, and, and bring in at ex its expense um, uh, the prose Edas and, and some of the sagas. Um, J.R.R. Tolkien taught Icelandic, uh, by the way, and the stories of The Hobbit um, the, the description of the land is almost exactly as um, described of, of Iceland. Um, if you read, Lord, watch the movies or read the books, Lord of the Rings, the stories of the Hobbit, uh, if you read the Silmarillion and all those different texts, these are all coming from these bodies of literature. Okay, So when you think about the popularity of those uh, uh, works, and realizing that they're directly coming from the source of this literature, you probably many of you did not know um, that, that this important treasure trove of literature on the English world and, and the rest of the, the of the world. So I just want to point that out. So um, what we have is this. Yes, he was a Christian writer, but he was writing to a Norwegian uh, um, prince about their culture and things that he wanted him to remember. So that's what we have in the Prose Ada by Snorri Sturluson. Later on, anonymously was found another work that, that is called the Poetic Ada, which is simply pagan poems that were written by a Christian, apparently preserving them. And we don't really kind of know a lot of details about what was going on with the Poetic Ada. But sometimes the Prose Ada quotes from it, and there's... Um, Basically, any story of Thor and Odin that you ever have heard, if you've ever studied Norse mythology or Germanic mythology, these are our only two sources for the most part, uh, mixed with the sagas. Okay, that is what I really want you to know. And in fact, if you study much of German history, the German Nazis were trying to recelebrate their Germanic past, and mainly. German nationalists were drawing from Icelandic sources to try to reimagine their ancient Germanic background because there was no other places to go. And in fact, that still remains the case today. So no matter what you want to think about Germanic history, a story of Odin and Thor or um, some of the cultural practices of Germanic people, this is what we have. And what's difficult about this is we don't know, one, how much does Snorri Sturluson put his own interpretation, his own elaborations into this uh, work? How much do these works reflect things very specific to Iceland and maybe Scandinavian countries such as Norway or broader Scandinavia? And does that totally reflect what we're seeing in um uh, the rest of the continent. We don't know. There's a description where uh, of Ganungagap is the um, kind of the beginning of, of, of time. It's, it, and, and there's a creation story. And there's depictions in it that have volcanoes and, and, and um, things that are very spe specific images that you could relate to from an Icelandic point of view that you may not see in a place like, let's say, Saxony. So again, is this reflective of the broader Germanic culture, oral culture that we lost, or something more specific? That's just going to be a debate that scholars have for a long time unless we get other literature found, okay? And so um, what's interesting about this, I just want to say, I'm not going to be able to go into long detail. So here, the Poetic Eda, we just have these poems, and they have things like the sayings of Odin, and the Havamal, 
And uh, it's interesting because you have quotes like saying that it's better to die in battle because you're going to die as an old man anyways, so you might as well do it gloriously. So, so some of those kind of stereotypes or ideas about the Viking warrior going off and fighting, dying, and going into Valhalla, the Victory Hall, up in in, in this, you know, in the afterlife, um, we can see those ideas reflected in some of these um, poems. We have the story uh, I talked about, um, Ganungagap. Um, there's uh, Yggdrasil, the, the, um, this is a picture here of the sacred ash tree where the entire universe is kind of separated into different worlds. There's hell at the bottom, but not all bad people can go to hell. There's a famous uh, great god who has almost a Jesus-like presence named Baldur, and he dies a tragic death. And he goes to hell, not as a bad person, but he doesn't die in battle and he doesn't go to Valhalla. And then there is Asgard, the actual realm of the gods. And then there's Midgard, the, the, the land of where humans live. Um, so we have this complex um, place, uh, a universe. And then you have Rag Ragnarok, which is the, the, the twilight of the gods, the last battle of the gods where they all destroy each other. At the end and then there is a kind of rebirth so you have all these interesting stories that come out of these texts um the um in the prose edda what i think is really interesting that i just kind of want to mention is that snorri sturluson has to make these pagan stories safe for a christian audience and what he does is he does something that other medieval writers did which is that he claims that these gods were in fact actually descendants of strong men that came from Troy after the fall of Troy and that people then started to see Odin and Thor as gods and that that is why people started to worship them ever falsely until they were corrected and, and actually worshiped the true God and so he, he, he basically tries to say look these characters I'm telling you were actually just humans, and then we were confused. But these are the stories that we had. And then he moves on, and he uses a medium in which he has what's called the tricking of Gelfi. And he, and he moves on to a story of a Swedish king who then sees this, like, kind of three-charactered men, almost like a trinity, this weird three characters. that they And they start having these discussions, a uh, 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 prose, written in prose, using some verse... Uh, some some um, uh, uh, Norse poetry to describe stories of the gods. And um, then he breaks up the other section and, and he's trying to preserve a tradition that was going to be lost. And he has another one called the Skald's Copper Mall, where he has the god Bra Bragi, or, um, or Bragi um, the god of poetry, um, meet with another uh, uh, god or a giant, um, Eager, and he explains things to him. And what ends up also happening in the Prose Edda is that he explains that these poems and these songs that are, were a part of court traditions um, in uh, Scandinavia and Iceland, um, these you had skaldic poets. Skaldic poetry was kind of a celebration, kind of propaganda pieces where uh, a poet would celebrate the legacy of a powerful uh, um, man and tell his great deeds and, you know, uh, and entertain guests. And these, these poems could be known far and wide and tell the story of this guy. And they used a complicated meter that Snorri Sturluson explains, a certain kind of literary style. And then... They had these things called kennings, where they made uh, uh, a kind of, like they would refer to things like, uh, let's say, um, they would say um, the honey's mead or, or the dwarf's mead. And you have to know the story, the myth behind it, and you would know that that's poetry. Um, but you'd have to know these inside stories on this. And so um, he wanted to preserve a knowledge about mythology so that these difficult poems and songs could also be understood and this tradition could be kept um and aren't we glad that he did that for us um that's all i'm going to have uh, left to say on this i'd like to go into more details but here you have access you know now you know about these books and these topics and um i hope that you explore more when you get a chance